Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. So my name is uh, Karl Rasmussen. I'm going to talk about uh, learning to control. Uh, something to quote from some of our early, one of our early speakers, something I'm, a project I'm hugely uh, um, enthusiastic about. Um, and some of the students who are working uh, with me on this are here, uh, Roger and uh, Andrew and uh, uh, Rowan and, and Mark are all here. Um, now, the, the project that we heard about uh, a little while ago about the, um, the automated statistician I think it's sort of fascinating stuff, but I think uh, it's a little bit limited, right? Because why would, you do a, uh, uh, why would you do an automated statistician? What you really want to do is you need to understand the data because you're going to do something, right? If you're not going to do anything anyway, then, you know, you don't need to do the statistics, right? So learning to control is actually closing the loop completely, right? It's saying we want to learn something from the data because we're going to take some actions, right? Otherwise, we, could, we, we, we should stop, right? Otherwise, it doesn't make any sense. Right, so uh, I didn't bring any algebra today. I didn't actually bring any slides either. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a few videos that will sort of motivate the ideas that are going on. So what I'm interested in is to how, to, how to use the ideas of control within, uh, within uh, ideas of learning within control. And uh, so when I look out there in the world, I sort of see a, uh, a big problem in control, right? So we have uh, biological organisms that seem to be extremely good at doing control, uh, so they're much better than, uh, than artificial systems. So for example, uh, one of the, uh, uh, David Walpert in our group, one of his favorite examples is playing chess, right? And actually the algorithm for playing chess is very easy to do, but actually the algorithm for moving the pieces is incredibly hard, right? And nobody in robotics actually know how to, how to program that in the sense that they would all be completely outperformed by any four-year-old, right? So somehow, the, contr the control algorithms that are being used are, are not really very good, right? Uh, and if you ask control people, you know, how am I going to solve this control problem, right? Then they're going to say, well, you need a lot of prior information about your domain, right? And you need to encode that into your model and into your control algorithm and stuff. And I think maybe that's wrong. Like, maybe you just need to look at the data, right? So what I'm going to try to do here is I'm going to show you some simple examples that basically build models based on the data that it sees and nothing much else. Um, so there's no domain-specific uh, prior knowledge in there. And basically try to come up with a control algorithm based on that. So I'm going to show you a number of examples of doing that. So the first one you may have seen before, so I apologize if that's the case. Uh, so this is a little inverted pendulum problem. Uh, so the idea is that you want the system to learn how to uh, balance the pendulum in the, uh, in, in, in the middle there. And the state space is four-dimensional, uh, so there's the position along the, where the cart is, there's the, um, the speed of the cart, there's the position of the pendulum and the angular velocity of the pendulum. There's one control action, which is you can apply a current to a motor that pulls the cart uh, back and forth. Uh, and I actually don't know what the dynamics of the system is. I, I measured that the pendulum is 12 and a half centimeters long, but apart from that, I don't really know anything about it. Uh, right? And we tell the algorithm uh, that it should balance uh, in the middle, so there's a, there's a point where the pendulum is swung up in the, in the, right, in the, in the um, unstable configuration. We say that's a good state, and states are worse when they move away from that. Okay, and that's what the, what the model has to play with. So, we, um, so there were first two little sessions that were random actions just to excite the system to get some knowledge about what's going on. And after that, we have these little sessions where we are trying to, where we then use the model that we have to come up with better control actions and that uh, is then executed, right? And you see things are getting, starting to get a little bit, uh, um, uh, a little bit better now. Um, and um, the... Uh, the actions that we're taking are, uh, are basically uh, continuous, uh, continuously we are, uh, we're providing a, um, a current to the system. Right? So we've now done about six sessions here, so each session is two and a half seconds long, so it has about 15 seconds of, um, uh, of experience. Um, well, let's see what happens the next. 
Okay, so basically it falls over, but that's because the session stops after two and a half seconds. There's a little bit longer uh, session after that. Uh, so this sort of flies in the face of the, uh, of the conventional wisdom, which is to say you need a lot of prior knowledge about what's going on in the system, right? So the, the, uh, the, it won't be any surprise to you that we're using Gaussian processes to capture the short-term dynamics. So we basically predict from a state and an action what's going to be the next state. Uh, and the prior knowledge that we have in there is that the dynamics are continuous, are smooth. So if you change the, the location a little bit, then the next configuration will change a little bit, and they are time invariant, right? If you do the same thing a little bit later in the day, then the same thing is going to happen, right? So that, that's the prior knowledge that we have in there. Um, so that's one example. So how, so how does this actually, uh, how does it actually uh, achieve this? How does it learn? Uh, that quickly. So one of the things that we take into uh, account is when we make the predictions about what's going to happen, then we make a probabilistic prediction. Like we actually predict that this is the distribution over things that might happen. Initially, when we start the training, then we don't know anything about the dynamics, right? Or we know very little about the dynamics. So, and that turns out, that turns out to be a very important aspect in the learning that you have to not only know what you know, but also know the limits of your knowledge, right? You can't just optimize over something that includes uncertainty. So here there's, include, there's in, uh, several types of uncertainty. That first of all, it could be that the system doesn't respond deterministically. Uh, it could also be that there's uncertainty due to the fact that you don't know what the dynamics are. There is a, a, a deterministic dynamics, but you don't know what it is, so you treat it as being, uh, as being stochastic. So the next little video, I'm going to show you how that um, how that uncertainty evolves. Okay, let me just stop that. Um, oh, that wasn't good. Okay. Okay. So here we have uh, basically uh, this is a um, a simulation setup. Um, so. Um, in the in the other in the other task, it was a it was a real example, and and a nice thing about that example was that the video that we obtained was basically the first time we plugged it in, right? So there wasn't any there were no free parameters in there. We basically plugged it in and it learned to balance the pendulum. It's not quite true. We didn't actually run the camera the first time. We did it again and 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 took the uh, and took the film right. But there's no uh, there's no there's no uh, human intervention in that process. Uh, so here I have a slightly more complicated pro uh, process. It's basically the same setup, but now I have uh, two pieces to the pendulum. Uh, and again, you only have one, uh, one action that you can apply. You can only apply a force to the cart. And the idea is that the goal is to balance both pendula. It should be uh, standing in the, in the upright uh, position. And the goal task is the one that's uh, um, up there in a, uh, in a plus. Now what I show you here are, yes? Is there Certainty as well as for doing the task. Uh, no, so the, there's a, there's only a reward for 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 getting the task as good as possible. So you basically the the function that you're minimizing is the average loss. Of course, if you have a, a huge uncertainty, then your average loss is going to be probably going to be pretty large, right? At, at least if you have uncertainty about the properties of the system that the loss function cares about, right? So there's no there's no explicit penalty on that, but implicitly. If you are very uncertain about what's happening, then your your cost isn't going to be that good. Yeah, but it's not something. There's no handcrafted uh, information in there over and above that. Okay, so the ellipses that that are being shown now are the the system's own representation of what it thinks the uncertainty is going to be about the position of the two joints. Okay, so watch that when it's while it's learning. So initially. Uh, it only keeps track of them for a fraction of a second, and then basically loses all notion of what's going on because its dynamics model is still pretty weak. So it tries a couple of different things there. Okay, so now it's actually confident that it can swing above horizontal, right? Uh, it, it knows enough about the dynamics. Later on, it gets a little bit better than that. It, it swings it up. And you can see it loses the phase information, right? So you get these very elongated distributions. It doesn't know exactly where it's going to be, but it knows it's going to be upright, see, in, in that case. And you can also see that sometimes uh, 
things happen that it thinks are going to happen, right? So it's not going to be particularly surprised at that. So it doesn't actually really learn very much from that. Sometimes something happens which it doesn't predict is happening. And of course, those trials are very informative. Right? It gains a lot of information uh, when, when, uh, when that happens. OK, so things get a bit, uh, a bit boring by now. Uh, so in that case, for example, it thought it was losing track of things. But actually, things were fine. Right? So that's another way in which it could be learning uh, these things. OK, so again, from very little prior knowledge, uh, basically just uh, smoothness and time invariance, uh, we, can learn this, uh, we can learn this pretty well. Um, so here's my last example, uh, which, is, um, which is a unicycle. Uh, so it's a, this is my MATLAB rendering of a, of a unicycle. So uh, it consists of a, of a wheel uh, and a disk that it can rotate at the top. So the wheel, you can apply a torque. If you're falling forwards or backwards, you can apply a torque to do something about that. If you fall sideways, then things are a little bit more complicated. Now, for real unicyclists, you can displace your weight sideways when you're to, to counteract the fact that you're falling sideways. Now, this unicycle can actually do, do that. So the disk at the top is a, is a uniform disk. I've only painted it this way so you can see what it's doing. Uh, so it can't displace its weight side sideways. What it can do is it can apply a torque to the disc, which will rotate the disc, which will cause the unicycle itself to counter-rotate so that it's now no longer falling sideways, but either forwards or backwards, which it can do something about. Okay? So that is the idea that you know, perhaps this thing is controllable by that, by, by that means. Right? But of course, we're not telling the system anything about that. Right? So the system, again, is just a, the configuration of the system. It's just a point in a, I think it is a 14-dimensional space, right? You have x and y, you have x and y dot, you have the pitch and roll angle, et cetera, et cetera, right? So there are, there are 14 coordinates. I think we throw away two of them. So we don't, for, we don't represent the absolute orientation, for example. We throw that away. And let's see what happens. <clears throat> so first, to set off things, we have 10 random trials. And what happens in those is, of course, that it falls over very quickly, right? Within a fraction of a second, it's in the ground. Uh, with, with random forces. Uh, and now we start using um, policies that have been, that have been optimized. <clears throat> you see, the first thing it learns pretty well is, is, is pitch. So now it's not falling forwards or backwards anymore. <laughs> it's having trouble that it, that it runs off, right? So this kind of mechanical system is actually mo um, much more stable at speed than at rest. At rest is actually the worst possible configuration you could be in. And even real unicyclists, they don't sit put, uh, uh, completely at rest, but they always rock back and forth, right? Because you need a little bit of motion uh, to become uh, more stable. OK, so after, you know, this is a, a, fraction, of a, sec, uh, a fraction of a minute's experience, uh, it's, it's clearly got uh, quite a bit of uh, information about uh, uh, what's going on here. I don't know how many of you can unicycle. So I, I tried learning unicycling. Uh, it's pretty hard. Uh, so I've, I've gotten a little bit better. I've trained for maybe about five hours. And I can stay on for a little bit more than half a second now, where it used to be a little bit less than half a second. Um, so the annoying thing about this video is that it looks pretty easy. Uh, so I actually tried to handcraft a controller uh, before I, 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 I ran this thing. And I didn't succeed. So it's, it's nebulously hard to, to, to actually have a controller that, uh, that uh, works well. So I think it doesn't fall over anymore. Uh, it's not particularly happy about staying, staying at rest. Right? Uh, it, it, likes, it likes movement, right? So what, what, it, what it does is it, it so, the, so the loss function here is, is just the distance of the top of the unicycle to the point over the, uh, over the origin, right? And so it's penalized indirectly for falling sideways because, because the top will, will not have the right height anymore. Uh, and there's a small penalty of spinning because otherwise it just discovers that spinning really fast on the point becomes super stable. Right? <laughs> That's not really what was intended. Uh, <clears throat> All right, so I think um, what I wanted to try to, to, to persuade people is that there's actually a, a very rich possibility of Machine learning, and by machine learning, I just mean algorithms that look at measurements, that look at the data, and, uh, and, and problems in control. And I think this is, for some reason, 
the, these two domains haven't really been connected up somehow in the literature, and the, um, and the communities that do control and do machine learning are also uh, somehow uh, very split. I think that's a pity because I think there's, a, there's, a, there's an excellent match between some of the techniques that we develop in our, in our communities and some of the problems that, that are out there. And I think this is actually what machine learners should be doing. Like they should be thinking about getting from data over insight to action. Right? That's what machine learning is about. Um, and I think sometimes uh, for many of the things we do, we kind of forget the big picture right? and we focus on these sort of little, uh, little tiny things. So, uh, I'm happy to take uh, questions. <laughs> yep. So is there any between trials? Yeah. So I so the videos have been fudged a little bit. So uh, between the trials, so it doesn't it doesn't try to learn during a trial. Although uh, of course. Uh, if you had a lot of computational resources, obviously, you know, that would be a good thing to do. Uh, but the, uh, the computational requirement to run this are actually quite large. So uh, there is, it takes about, uh, about maybe half an hour or an hour on my laptop of computation between each of these trials. Um, so that's a, that's, a, that's a problem that we are, that we're, that we are up against. Um, yeah. I don't know much about control, but it seems in this example that the, the cost is sort of the proximity to the center di of, the, of the disk, right? So there, is there some component with respect to planning, or do, do you have to solve the planning problem separately, or is that folded into a single policy that just does actions and no? Okay, so the policy, it? the policy is just, it just minimizes the expected cost over some long finite horizon, right? In this case, it's 10 seconds. Like, so we just say, well, problem? sorry? Uh, is that a tractable problem, this, this planning problem? Uh, no, so we just do we just do uh, conjugate gradient search in the space of the policy, and the policy is just a function that maps from state to action. Right, so we're just searching. And in this case, actually, the policy is a linear function of the space, although the dynamics model, of course, is a nonlinear function of the state. Yeah. So all in all, there are only you know 24 parameters that are really being learned here. Although it has to learn a lot of complicated stuff you know, under the hood to capture the dynamics. Uh, another thing that which is interesting is, of course, that uh, it doesn't in a in a in a fourteen dimensional space you can't explore the space, right? The space is going to be way too large, right? And it only knows about these very small trajectories around the, uh, in the space, but those are the things that it needs to actually stay upright, right? And that's probably a characteristic of of of, of these learning uh, systems that you have to have algorithms that are on policy. That's right because just, just finding the dynamics of a system, you know, that's way too difficult. Right? We'll never be able to do that. But finding the parts of the dynamics which are relevant to solving the control task is a much smaller problem, and you have to focus on that problem, right? And this is something that's very natural in reinforcement learning. Like, people think about on-policy methods, but that's not very natural in control, right? Because people tend to split the control problem, the design of the control and the design of the dynamics identification from the actual from the actual controller, right? And that's very unhelp unhelpful to do that split. Yep. So do you think it would be realistic to try and uh, learn, f say, from a raw camera image that's pointed at... Ah, so I have a student working on that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's an excellent idea, right? So instead of... So one of the nice things here is that the, uh, the, um, the sensors don't have to be calibrated. Like, we actually don't really know. I don't know in the, in, in the pendulum example if I, if I put a a positive current, does it move left or right? Well, I don't know. It figured it out, right? And so similarly, we don't really have to have measurements of that, of that kind, but you would, you, would, uh, you would like to have you know, much more generic uh, input to the system, right? So we're trying to do the pendulum now with, uh, with just with camera feedback instead. Yep? On that topic, have you looked at this um, video game simulator problem? I hadn't looked at it, but I thought it might be interesting. Uh, yeah, yeah. How good does it get? How good does it get? Um, okay, so <clears throat> there's a so the the I think there's a limitation in the in the way that the that the problem is uh, is 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 specified here. Um, so it's not really 
it's not really clear what the real goal is. It's to, it's to stay upright without moving around too much, right? But that's a bit vague, right? So I can't really, I haven't tried to quantify, you know, how, how well can I achieve that task. So from a control perspective, uh, it's a sort of a slightly odd task because um, a simple controller, for example, a thermostat, basically what it does is if the temperature is a little bit too low, then it heats a little bit. And if the temperature is a lot too low, then it heats a lot, right? But this kind, of control, this kind of system, you can't use that because as soon as you start falling a little bit sideways, then you have to actually respond by turning 90 degrees. Like you can't turn a little bit to compensate for that, right? So I don't know what the, there are probably some fancy terms for, for what, what systems like that mean, right? But it's a, it's a slightly more involved uh, control task. And it's not, you, you can't sort of think about things around the equilibrium state because that isn't really an equilibrium state. Like you can't stay still around a state you'd have to think about equilibrium orbits or something sort of more complicated than that, right? But, but that's, you know, that's, that, that's difficult stuff. Yeah. So I don't really know, you know how to evaluate really how, how, how well it is, except for the fact that it stays up, and that's, that's not easy. Right? Yeah? But you could modify it to, so now each, each run has a task go from A to B. Yeah, so that's, that's right, that's right. Yeah. So this is, sort of a, this is sort of phrased as a regulation program, uh, problem, but actually, you know, you should, you should be using this for, to, to, to go from A to B, right? You, you want to achieve something rather than just kind of staying upright, right? And then that, that would be, be a more natural way of phrasing a real task. Yeah. And if you're carrying the milk on the top, you probably don't want to shake it this way too much. Right, so. yeah. Stirred, not shaken, right? It's a, yeah. <laughs> yep? How would you characterize uh, the property of systems w um, that you cannot learn? <coughs> uh, so why can't you learn them? Uh, uh. You can learn everything. I give you any degree of freedom, you can learn. You know, you, there are some tasks, some goals that you cannot learn. You, if, I give you a, if I give you a pen, you, you can't have it on the moon by itself or something like that. You know. Okay, so it, so it, so it, is it possible to balance the, the unicycle? Uh, well, we didn't know. We kind of hoped it was. Uh, is there a way to characterize the fact that it's not possible? Uh, no, no, I, I don't know about that. So that so that's also, I mean, many so many uh, questions that are answered within control uh, within the control literature are things that characterize is something controllable and is it optimal? And these are things that I don't really know. Uh, how to think about, but I also think that's maybe a consequence of this sort of style of biological learning. Like you can learn to ride the bicycle, but are you optimal? Uh, I mean, that's sort of a bizarre question, right? You're good enough, right? Uh, <laughs> so I think if you focus on optimality, then things get really difficult, right? So maybe we should back off from that question. All right. Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available.